Today you'll be listening to episode four of FBC's So That podcast. We'll be talking about a strategy that is engaging missions from all the way back in the New Testament to today. It's called the Person of Peace Strategy. How does God use us to reach those who are closest to us? Hope you enjoy the podcast. This is Pastor Chad on FBC's So That podcast. This is an encouraging place to hear how God is working in and around us. We know that he blesses his people so that they can bless the world around them. Join us as we discuss how to join God in all that he is doing. Why is God working in our life, our church, and our community? It's so that. Hi, this is Pastor Chad. Uh, I'm here with Sadie Smith, and we are going to have our missions podcast today for First Pastor Church. We hope that you're doing well and hope that you're excited to hear what we've got uh, on schedule for you today. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's just the two of us uh, for this episode, and uh, we're going to be talking through a really cool uh, strategy that we see in the New Testament that is uh, really common in missions today, so we'll be introducing that to you. But before we get there, how are you doing today, Sadie? I'm well. It's a nice rainy day, and we were hoping for more springtime weather, but um, glad to be here and excited to. to I feel like this was our last blast of cold. I you hope know, so. Like, I'm ready to plant my garden. <laughs> I'm ready for the for that. <clears throat> I'm one of those people that uh, after living in South Texas uh, for 10 years, I'm ready. I'm okay for a little bit of cold. I enjoy the cool weather, and uh, so I'm looking forward to to the the temperatures heating up. But um, I've also really enjoyed. This was a lot colder than the valley weather. You know, it's just four hours away, four hours yeah, south, but it crazy. is a very different climate. True. And uh, so this was the coldest winter our family has had in a long time. So yeah, it's exciting to be here. Exciting to be with you. Uh, Dennis is back, so yes. you feel whole again. Yes. And uh, We're excited back for as that. A family. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so man, I'm so glad for you guys. Well, uh, let's let's jump in. Let's jump in. So. Um, I know we're going to start here. We're going to look at this verse from Acts 2.42. Let, let's read it, and then uh, we'll start talking about it. Great. Yeah, I think it's, it's what, 48, I think, is what we're talking about there. Okay. Acts 2.48? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Start there, or should I start every day? 46? Um, yeah, 46. Okay. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I I love these verses. I mean, they're famous verses. They're talking about early church, the day of Pentecost, and some of the impacts of that day. And and everybody has heard these uh, a number of times, but there's a couple portions I just want to Look at her real clearly. In 46 there, at the end of it, it says that they broke bread in, in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's a comma. It says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So all of that whole sentence there, uh, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere, praising God and enjoying favor. All of those things happened in a home. You know, it's a, it's an, a very interesting thing to me, and it's exciting to think about. But we we everybody is aware of what happened in the temple, right? Mm-hmm. They gathered there daily. That's fine. But you know, after the stoning of Stephen, the temple is not available to them anymore. the 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 work that happened in a large gathering almost completely shuts down, and it's something we really don't see for the rest of the Book of Acts. There's some hints, like when they get uh, Paul teaches in in Ephesus for two years, and and, and there may have been some places where there were gatherings, but definitely not on a scope and scale like we see here at this moment in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And so from from here on, one of the primary strategies um, for the new developing church and areas that it grows is to meet in homes. And uh, mm-hmm. and in those homes, uh, that's where these things happen. They eat together, they enjoy each other's company, they praise God together, and they enjoy the favor of the community, the people around them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so... That's a, a really interesting thing to see there, and and it really sets for us maybe the tone of what we're going to talk about today, uh, this idea that that there's a strategy that Jesus employed, that his disciples employed, later Paul employed, and it's also being used today in missions all around the world that's called the House of Peace Strategy. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's also called the Person of Peace Strategy. And so today on our podcast, we're going to kind of walk through and take a look at what does it mean, uh, one, uh, that this strategy is there. But secondly, we want to ask the question, are we people of peace? Are mm-hmm. we the type of people that open our life to the gospel and then because of the gospel's work in us, that it's available to everyone else 
in our life, everyone mm-hmm. around us. Um, so you might think immediately your family members, but beyond your immediate family, your friends, classmates, coworkers, neighbors, right? The people that you interact with, we might call it a, a relational network uh, today. There's a Greek word, we'll talk about it later, called oikos, and oikos means your household. But the household of the first century was much bigger than a, than yeah. the household today. That is, you know, your husband, wife, and three kids. Yes. Um, the household included extended family and servants. servants or workers or people that might be living within the, the confines of your space and still very much a part of your household. So uh, interesting stuff. So l- 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 I know we're going to go through some other things, uh, different verses. So let's let's move forward with this. Okay, so tell me. About this strategy, you said it could be called house of peace or person of peace strategy. So am I understanding you correctly that this is the gospel, like you said, coming to someone and then them opening up their homes and basically sharing the gospel with those that they love or even just those are around them. And then we see it then going out. So is this all is the is the person of peace or the house of peace based on the location? Is it the home? Is that what we're kind of discussing? The home becomes the base of operations, but it's mm-hmm. always based on the people, okay. right? Uh, an empty home doesn't make for a, a right. great place for there to be a lot of peace. There has to be a home that's got the people in it. So let, let, let me give you an example, right? Yes. So we can go to Mark chapter 1. Okay. Uh, Mark is a, is a gospel that is largely uh, um, known to be Peter's gospel. Uh, the reason is because John Mark was Peter's disciple, and John Mark wrote the book of Mark. And uh, very likely that the primary contributor to this book is Peter himself. And uh, it's a very interesting book. The way that it's organized and written is is really different than Matthew and Luke. And, uh, of course, John is different than the other three. But but all of that to say that Mark is stand, it stands unique. One of the things that's really exciting about it is how often the writer uses the words immediately. It's like a very action-oriented book. There's a lot a lot of things happen, and then immediately they go and do something else. And immediately Jesus leaves, and, and immediately they go across the lake. There's a lot of these these really— um, Time stamps. Time stamps. <laughs> yeah. so just kind of— uh, The funny thing is it's not always chronological. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Luke, yeah. Luke tries to put things in chronological order. Mm-hmm. Mark is trying to tell the story in a way that— makes a lot of sense. He's not necessarily concerned with whether it happens all in the instruct order. So it's really funny. Immediately they go and do, it may not actually have been the same day or Mm. it kind of connects different things um, to show the power of Jesus in a sequential order. Anyway, all that to say, if you look at Mark chapter one, you find a really cool story when Jesus calls his first disciples. And uh, so you start like verse 16 uh, we can look at it right here. It says that Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. He says, come, follow me, and I will, I will send you out to fish for people. And verse 18 says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Everybody, again, very familiar with the story. This is the Simon that is in this story, Simon and Andrew. Um, uh, it's Simon later is called Peter, right? So here we have... Uh, the introduction of Peter to Jesus. If you skip down just a little bit, there's a little uh, connector verse we need to see here. Verse 21, it says, they went to Capernaum, um, and on the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. Now, I I highlight that because I want you to see the name of the city. The city is Capernaum, uh, the city where Peter lived. Mm -hmm. And, And largely, again, church history would say that this is probably where Jesus spent most of his time as he ministered in the north around the Sea of Galilee uh, most of his ministry career happens around this space. So Peter's home here in Capernaum becomes kind of the base of operations for Jesus' entire uh, ministry uh, for the next three years. And so there's this whole interaction with the synagogue, but then skip with me down to verse 29. Mm-hmm. And it says, as soon as they left the synagogue, again, this is Mark, and there's immediately, as soon as they went, for the, mm-hmm. they went to the home of James, uh, sorry, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. All right, so here we go. Now we're at Peter's house. And Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went up, he took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So again, everyone knows the story, but I, what I want to highlight is the place, right? Mm-hmm. We're just talking about this idea um, that that the gospel was moving from home to home in Jerusalem. So here, Peter's first interaction with Jesus, his first day with Jesus, Jesus ends up in Peter's house. And already... He comes into the house, and the very first thing that happens is Peter's mother-in-law meets Mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And as a result of meeting Jesus, 
she gets healed from a sickness. I mean, it doesn't tell us how bad the sickness is or anything else, but it's bad enough that she was in bed. Mm -hmm. So then you go on, verse 32, it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and even possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door. So what door is this, Sadie? Peter's house. This is Peter's house. See, I my first instinct is, oh, whenever all the people gathered and Jesus was healing, I think of, you know, a, a crowd, a mountainside, or they came to the... They're in the plaza in the exactly, middle of the city or something. just in a yeah. group setting, but I, he's at the door. It literally says house. the door. So this is Peter's home. So this is the picture. Peter meets Jesus mm-hmm. next to the Sea of Galilee, invites him to his hometown, says, come stay with me, Peter. Or Jesus. So Jesus goes with Peter to his town, heals his mother-in-law. So because of Peter's invitation, Peter's entire household, whoever's living in the home, meets Jesus. Mm -hmm. But the the power and fame of Jesus is so meaningful that it doesn't just stop with his family. It actually goes into the whole community. And so what we have here in this verse 32, verse 33, is that Jesus' interaction with Peter made Jesus available to everyone in Peter's town. Mm -hmm. Like you think about this, the whole town of Capernaum brings out their sick and even possessed, and they expect that Jesus is going to help them. Mm-hmm. And so this is a very perfect picture of what you might call that person of peace strategy. Peter becomes a very clear example of a person of peace. When someone meets Jesus, that they are so impacted by him that they bring him to their own place and they invite the people around them mm-hmm. to know him as well. And that is so powerful that the people outside of that, that is within their sphere of influence, find and know Jesus. So there's a, a little um, uh, a, a training tool I use when we're talking about a person of peace strategy. And I say a person of peace is someone that welcomes the messenger. They're kind to the messenger. Peter was kind to Jesus. Right. The next thing is that they they welcome the message. They hear the message and respond powerfully. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter, obviously, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men is Jesus's words. And Peter immediately lays down his nets and follow. But the last thing is that a person of peace uh, welcomes the mission of the messenger. Right. So um, the mission is that Jesus was not just trying to reach Peter. Mm-hmm. And he definitely wasn't just trying to reach Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus's goal was to bring glory from the entire town of Capernaum towards God. Mm-hmm. And so through one interaction, Peter, the whole Capernaum is opened up to Jesus. Mm-hmm. What an incredible, powerful interaction. So that, that, that those three things, the, the person of peace, the house of peace is someone that welcomes the messenger, mm-hmm. they welcome the message, and they welcome the, the mission of the messenger. And uh, so there's a couple of things as you're thinking about, you're listening to this podcast, ask yourself, have you welcomed mm-hmm. Have you welcomed the messenger, the person that shared faith with you? Probably so. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably welcome messenger. Have you welcomed the message? Probably so, right? You've, you've asked Jesus to be king of your life. Like you've already given your heart to him. And so the message of the gospel has taken root in your heart and soul. That's fantastic. But have you joined in the mission? And that's where I find a lot of believers in the, in the world, uh, especially in the Western world, United States and Europe, struggle with understanding what is the mission of God and how do I engage with his work? Because a person of peace, it's not enough just to welcome the message and the messenger. They have to also engage in the mission or their whole community doesn't hear uh, the, the the gospel through them. And so that's a, a really powerful picture. Mm-hmm. One thing I'll say is I love the, the first thing that Jesus says to Peter is he calls him, but he says, come and I will make you fisher of men. So right away, he's already sharing, this is our mission. Yeah. It's just up front from yeah, the beginning. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. It's great. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you a really mature rabbi and you're going to be just like me in every yeah. way. No, no. Or from he doesn't the beginning. even just say, follow me. That's no, no, the no, thing. No. He says, and I'll make you a fisher of men. Sadie, there's so much in that. We, we could do a whole other podcast just on what it means <laughs> to be a fisher of fishermen. One of the things when I've been training uh, group leaders and, and, and home church pastors and, and disciples uh, over the last I don't know, 15 to 20 years, I always talk about these three things I want people to to, to think about one is how they follow Jesus. They abide deeply in him. The John 15 or John 17, this says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. 
right? This fit, this following Jesus is a key component. It's it is the faithfulness in our hearts and minds that shepherds our actions, right? Um, so the how are you following is a question I always ask my my disciples or people that I'm, I'm teaching and training. The second thing is how are you fishing, right? Mm-hmm. How are you fishing for men? What is your weekly activity in trying to engage lostness with the gospel? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a whole other subsect we could talk about ownership of segments. What parts are your responsibility? Others all this kind of things. But in the end, I want to ask all the time: Who are you sharing your faith with? Right. Uh, is that your your mom, your family, your cousin? Uh, is co-workers. it your neighbors, coworkers, classmates? All right, the, your relational network. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, we're kind of talking about this this whole like house of peace thing. It's the people that you have access to regularly. Mm-hmm. So, following, how are you following? How are you fishing? And now I have the third one: is how are you feeding? How are you caring for the hurting, the broken, the lost, the needy? Uh, we we tend to break those into different pieces. Uh, if you look at Jesus' command to love your neighbors yourself, you see that those are all connected. Uh, but we sent, tend to have like a spiritual emphasis and then a humanitarian emphasis. Yeah. <laughs> so we separated those into fishing, following fishing and feeding are those three things that I always, always use as a, a thing. So really, really interesting. You, you, you tagged on to that. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. So getting back to this, Jesus later on gives his disciples very clear instructions on how to find this person, this house of peace. And uh, so if you turn with me over to Luke chapter 10. And Luke 10, Jesus' disciple group is much larger than the 12. It says that he appoints 72. So mm-hmm. we're Luke 10, starting verse 1. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead. So I'm sorry, sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. And so I want you to see right there, like in the little little thing, he's sending out disciples. He's encouraging them to go to places where he hasn't been yet, but he's planning to go. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this the, again, this this really bold comment: the harvest is plentiful, workers are few. And every place I travel in the world, when I talk to missionaries, ask them, "What is your biggest need?" This they always say, "We need man hours. Help. We need help. Mm-hmm. We need more people." There are far more opportunities than we have ability to pursue. Mm-hmm. This is one of those reasons I when, when you're listening to this podcast, like one of my goals is to to engage the entire church in the work of the ministry. We need your hands and feet to be involved. Mm-hmm. We love that you attend the church. We love that your heart and soul engage. We love that you give your resources. But beyond that, we need to. We need you to give yourself mm-hmm. uh, to the work of the kingdom because we cannot do all the things that God is calling us to do because we just don't have enough manpower. We don't have enough hours. We don't have enough energy uh, to put it all all together. And so this is one of those places where Jesus says it, and it's so clear there. But yeah. he continues. If you want, re- read from verse five down to, to verse nine. Okay. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. These these verses, it's paralleled by the way, Matthew ten, like the the very very similar instruction sets, uh, Matthew ten, Luke ten, but this house of peace thing becomes really really clear here. Like mm-hmm. if you go to a new village, now we don't live in villages today, so it's a little different, right? Suburb, town. you go to a new suburb, <laughs> a new neighborhood. You walk down a street you've never known. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say to 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 go to every single door. He says go and knock on doors until you find someone that invites you in, that mm-hmm. welcomes you in. Now, we could think about this on a very literal sense. Um, someone might invite you in for a lunch or come on in and have a, have a Coke with me or drink some iced tea on the porch, whatever. But really what, what he's talking about is people that welcome you into their life. They're people mm-hmm. that give you access. And, uh, and through that access, he says, stay there. So listen, the key to reaching a new community is not a huge evangelistic event that gets all the community at once. It's finding one person that is known in that community mm-hmm. and then reaching them and then empowering them to reach their own their own community. So through this interaction. An influencer. It's an influencer. <laughs> You're looking for, praying for, and that's what this person yes. of peace. Remember, the person of peace, they welcome the messenger, they welcome the message, and they welcome the mission. Mm-hmm. And so you've got this person who sees these disciples coming, they knock knock on his gate, invites them to come on in. I'd like to get to know you better. They 
they share the gospel and the, the person responds to the gospel and then the person is so excited about what the gospel is doing in him that he wants to make sure that his family and neighbors hear about it. Mm-hmm. And so this strategy is one that that Jesus clearly taught to his his disciples. The, the crazy thing here is that there's a flip side to this particular um, message is he says, those that welcome you in, your peace will stay with them. Basically, they're going to have access to the gospel. But if you go to a town and you go through the entire town and nobody welcomes you in, there's not one person there that is open or welcoming to you, which means they're rejecting the messenger, they're rejecting the message, they're rejecting the mission. Mm-hmm. He says, shake the dust off your feet. And it's actually pretty scary. He goes on later and talks about what's going to happen to those places. And uh, and it's really a, a sad thing. Sodom. It's Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah is, mm-hmm. the, is the comparison. And so when you think about this, the, 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 the sheer weight of what these people are doing when you knock on their door, they have no idea that they may be making de- decisions that not only impact eternity, but it impacts their, ava- their accessibility to the gospel. Mm-hmm. Like when they say no to you, Sadie, when, when you say to somebody, have you ever had a relationship with Jesus? And they say, oh, I don't believe in any of that. Like they're not just rejecting you. And that's what we feel. We feel rejection, mm-hmm. but they're rejecting Jesus in you. And that's such a bigger deal. Mm-hmm. They're only going to have so many opportunities in their lifetime. And you pray that one of them, their heart is drawn towards him, right? One of them. So this person of peace is is the key. Uh, one of the famous missions writers, Don Richardson, would call it a, the the cultural key to any community. And uh, and so it's it's a really interesting thing. We can talk about like how the gospel goes into places it's never been. This is one of the primary ways he uses the people who respond first to reach out through them to their community. And and uh, and culture, mm. and that's a powerful thing. So we'll we'll have one more story here, yeah. and uh, and we'll finish up on on this perspective. But uh, we'll go over to Acts chapter ten. Well, that's what I was going to say. Um, so in in light of the story in Acts chapter ten with Cornelius, tell us. Let's read it. But I want you to kind of give us an example of of what that looks like for us today, because we we heard a sermon on this last Sunday from Pastor mm-hmm. Daniel, yeah, and then before great, that, yeah, great message, um, mm-hmm. Pastor Garrett. So. Yes, it, yeah, we got three I've, weeks on Cornelius. By yeah. the way, Garrett, Daniel, and Jason <laughs> this coming weekend is giving a recap on on it. So a uh, really but it, cool. But thing. it's a little bit of a pivot though in in the mission in the gospel mission. So let's kind of talk through that after we do. You want to read a little bit of it, and then we can kind of. Yeah, let's actually. We we've actually spent so much time on it. Uh, we can let you read it. The whole chapter of of Acts chapter ten and honestly Acts chapter eleven are focused on the story of Cornelius, and so it's a lot a lot of scripture. Um, but let's just retell the story real fast. Um, what happens in the story <clears throat> is that Cornelius is a Roman soldier, um, probably a commander of some some level. Um, he definitely has some authority. Uh, the scripture says that he's a God fearing man, mm-hmm. which uh, is interesting uh, among the Romans, and and so the writer Luke is telling us that he had some sort of faith uh, mm-hmm. before this interaction, uh, enough so that an angel appears to him and says, "Send for Peter." Um, at the same time, this is crazy, right? We have visions and dreams and angels. This is a really wild story. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he he sends for Peter, and while Peter is in another city far away, he has this other vision that God was telling him to take and eat from this uh, this this you know group of unclean animals that he's seeing in his vision. And Peter says, "Far be it from me, Lord, I would never eat such things." And mm-hmm. and God says to him in the in the vision, like, "Don't call unclean what I've made clean." Big, big, big story here. We could tell a whole other podcast on this particular mm-hmm. thing. But but in the end, the, he has the vision three different times. And what becomes really clear to him is that the old ceremonial, clean, unclean laws of the Old Testament are, are changing in front of his eyes. Mm-hmm. And what God's saying is, I'm making clean things that you think are unclean. And so he's he's ready for this. At the end of the vision, the guys from Cornelius knock on the door, and Peter as a devout Jew, is invited to go into a Roman's home. Mm-hmm. So Peter goes the next day, he gets to Cornelius' house, and uh, and Cornelius has gathered all of his household, is the word, the Greek word, if you read it in, uh, in Greek, it's oikos. He's gazzled, gathered his family, friends, probably the people that reported to him. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got his large community gathered at his home awaiting Peter. But so, it would have been unclean for Peter to go into. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're there waiting. 
Peter is invited into the home. He goes in. Mm-hmm. Peter says, I can see now what the Lord was doing. He was telling yeah. me not to call unclean that which is clean. And, uh, and it's this moment for Peter where he realizes that God is doing something different. Mm-hmm. Um, because of Peter, there's a couple of different pieces that are kind of funny. Like he's staying in the home of a tanner in Joppa, which is also an unclean space. Like Jews aren't supposed to touch dead things. Mm-hmm. So the space where a tanner was living would have been an unclean space. So it's really interesting how God is talking to Peter about clean, unclean when he's living in an unclean environment according to Jewish law. So he goes from one unclean Jewish space now into an unclean Gentile space. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting little thing that, that the timing of it is very, very uh, suspect and interesting as well in the end. So he, he goes in there, he shares a very powerful gospel message with Cornelius and his family. And immediately it doesn't, there's no conversion moment. It says immediately the spirit of God falls on Cornelius and his family. And it shocks Peter and the other men that are with him, and they're like, whoa, they received the Spirit the same way that we did. Mm-hmm. And so the the picture here is so powerful. It's it's showing that God is fully available to the Gentiles in the same way that he's available to the Jews, which mm-hmm. which is shocking. So um, instead of the clean versus unclean, do I hear you saying it's more so the Jew versus Gentile that that he's trying to show Peter through this? Well, the Gentiles were ceremonially unclean. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. So, what, so this, it's the picture of This okay, is the, the picture people. is that now the Gentiles are clean. Mm-hmm. The, Jew, the Jewish follower of Jesus can interact with the Gentile as an equal, not as a sub, a sub layer of the culture. It's powerful. They don't, the Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew first. And this actually becomes a major argument in the rest of the, mm-hmm. the, of Acts, but especially heading up to Acts chapter 15. Luke is laying a foundation in this story for all of Paul's ministry among the Gentiles, mm-hmm. right? So this is a really big picture. Pivotal. But what I just want to talk about for a minute here is, is below the big, almost metaphysical, huge perspective here is this thing where Cornelius... As a God follower, he invites him into the his home. perfect person of peace, right? <laughs> yeah. He invites Peter into his home. He welcomes the messenger. Mm-hmm. He hears the message of God and responds powerfully. It grips him. It changes him. Mm-hmm. And then immediately, even before Peter arrives there, he's already welcomed the mission. He's so in on this that he's invited, invited his community to join in his, his own discovery, mm-hmm. right? So they discover God and Jesus at the same time through Peter and all of Pete, of, of Cornelius's wow. uh, network, his oikos, his household, his community relationship, all of it is impacted at the same moment. Mm-hmm. This is the last time we hear of Cornelius. Um, we, we don't hear him later on. We don't know what he did. You know, we go to the end of Acts and 20 years has gone by. We know that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. Cornelius is not mentioned again in scripture. And uh, honestly, I've never seen anything church history try to tell what Cornelius did or didn't do after this event. There probably is something out there. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Somebody who loves research, see if you can give us any insight (laughs) on what happened to Cornelius after this. But what happens here is we see again, this clear, what Jesus gave to his disciples is clearly now what Peter is engaging with with Cornelius. And this oikos ministry, this person of peace strategy, is a primary strategy when you watch the the work of the Apostle Paul that's going to be you know the, the content of the book of Acts from Acts chapter 15 all the way to Acts 28. And so it's this powerful thing. And, and here's where I want to land. We're, we're coming down here. We're coming mm-hmm. down to the end. This is a strategy that works today. Yeah. When we work in a context that is familiar to us, you grew up in, in this town, you, you know people, they speak the same language, you have the same culture, you, mm-hmm. you look the same, you act the same, you want the same things. You know, you think about Bernie. Bernie is like a perfect example of pretty homogenous group of people who have very similar life, vision, and, and direction. You hear about um, the Bernie bubble. The Bernie bubble, all of that. But this is how the gospel works in these type of environments. It's by people sharing their faith, sharing the hope of their home and family and heart with the people around them. And that's how the gospel moves. Mm-hmm. And so as we as we move towards Easter, as we're thinking through how God is going to use this, I want to encourage every one of you to look and ask yourself this question, are you a person of peace? Mm. Are you willing to not only welcome the message and the messenger, 
Are you willing to welcome the mission of God in your life? Because God is expecting. He, Your first mission field is for you to engage the people that live close to you, the people that you see day in and day out. Now, you might say, these are the hardest people. They're the ones that have rejected God. They know that I'm a Christian. That's the perfect thing. We want them to know that you're a Christian so that in their moment of need, in their moment of crisis, in their time when they say, I don't know if you exist, God, but mm-hmm. if you're there, I need this you, that they will. know where to go. You're the person of peace. You're the person of peace. You're the person that says, I can help you find peace, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm praying. I've been praying this for a long time, but I pray that every single believer at First Baptist Church would be a clear person of peace. Mm -hmm. That is the role of a home missionary, (laughs) someone that hasn't been sent. Now, listen, if you're going to go cross-culturally, let's just say that you decide you want to do outreach to Hispanic people and comfort, or you want to go work with Afghans in San Antonio, or you want to be like some missionaries and go to the other side of the planet. Well, now it's going to be much more complex because you don't have oikos. You don't have a household and friends and family and and Mm -hmm. classmates and coworkers. You're going as a stranger into a new place, and then you have to find the person of peace. Mm -hmm. So for a home mission like... First Baptist Church, Bernie, our task is to be persons of peace. Mm -hmm. When you want to work cross-culturally, then you look for and find that person of peace, and then you work through them to engage their community, their neighborhood, their class, their classmates, their their livelihood, all of those things. And that's a primary strategy. It's incredible what God is doing through this strategy today in the world. And uh, I'll finish with this one story. Uh, I've been talking to a friend of mine that works with movements, church planting movements, and there's over 1,900 movements right now being tracked globally. Uh, Over the last 20 years, listen to this, 79 million people have come to faith through movements in in almost completely the unreached places of the world, Mm -hmm. places where the gospel has not thrived in 2,000 years, almost 80 million. Now, if you think about it, that's 1% of global population. In 20 years, 1% of the global population have come to faith through Oikos-type work, through House of Peace-type ministry, uh, in the most difficult places to be, the most difficult people to reach in the world. And that's happening in our day. That's happening around us now. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so my prayer is that God would use these strategies to impact how we see our community and how we uh, work through. We could talk about saturation visions and how we can see, uh, make we can ensure that everyone that lives in Bernie hears the gospel every year. Uh, we could talk about a Kendall County wide. We could talk about what it would take to reach a city like San Antonio. Those are all big visions, big, big questions. Um, but in the end, the very simple thing that I want you to hear today is how do you see yourself and are you a peaceful person? Are you a person of peace? Well, it- and how are you opening your home to people? And Chad, <laughs> Pastor Chad, does everybody on your street know that you're that person of peace? You know, that's all I can think of in this in this session is do my neighbors know that that I'm a person of peace or am I pulling in my driveway and running into my house and not talking to anybody. You know, it's so convicting. We could talk even about this person of peace, the description of the, like, it's not a person of war, mm-hmm. right? Some people seem to think that they need to go to war with their unsaved neighbors. We need to tell right. them why they're wrong and right. convince them of how sinful they are. And those things, there's yeah. a place for it. Mm-hmm. But a person of peace is someone that welcomes their neighbors and friends and community. They're peacemakers. They wow. love them. They care for them. And they're known for that. And so, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, so much here. It's great. So much here. Well, we I'm have gone 32 to... minutes, so we are past our 30 minute goal. Sadie, I so think I'm so thankful for all that you're doing. And it's great uh, to be here. I'm so glad that you're here with me. And uh, I'm really thankful for these podcasts. I hope for our listeners that this is a really meaningful time. I hope that you're encouraged and challenged. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Have, well, and one thing, oh, I'll say ahead, this one thing. As, a, as you were speaking at the end about Cornelius inviting his friends and family in, it made me think of this podcast and why we're here. And everyone listening may think, why, why are we taking time and resources to record this? It's all about come and see, come and hear what the Lord is doing, what he's done. And that's exactly what he was doing in his home. He was inviting his friends and family, come and see, come and hear the word. We can all be changed and then go out and share that word with the world. And that's why we're here. That's why we're recording this podcast. Well, I love, uh, we keep on going, (laughs) keep on going. I love that in this story, the Cornelia story, you have Peter, who I think, again, the first person of peace you see in the book of Mark sharing the gospel 
with Cornelius, who's the first Gentile person of peace that we see in scriptures. Mm -hmm. And what a powerful moment that not only are we seeing the transfer of the Spirit of God, which fell on Peter at Pentecost, but now falls on Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, but we see this transference of of method Mm -hmm. and 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 tool as well like like an application an application today. there's so yes. much here there's so much here so guys i hope that this is fun for you we've had a blast mm-hmm. uh if you have any questions we'd love to serve you have a wonderful day and uh, we'll talk to you soon god bless we are so thankful that you joined our podcast today we would love to hear any feedback you may have for us remember psalm 67 says may god be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Don't forget why the Lord blesses us. It's so that we can be a blessing to those around us. Until next time, God bless.